Listeners, readers, welcome to the Fox page where we dive deep into the very best books. I'm Kimberly Ford, one time adjunct professor at Berkeley, best selling author, and PhD in Spanish and French literature. Today, I'm really excited to dive into a really important text by Gail Jones called Corregidora. So this is a little bit tricky for me because um, with my background, uh, I, you know, not to sound like such a weird poser person, uh, but it's a little difficult for me to know how something like this title would be pronounced um, just by someone who doesn't speak any Spanish at all, and you know, an English speaker, for example. Corregidora? Corregidora? Not sure. Um, so Gail Jones is a very important writer whose books that were published when she was only 25 years old in the middle of 1970s, you know, say 1975 or so, extremely, extremely important books that spoke about the experience of being a black woman in the South. And um, she had this very kind of big, you know, uh, entrance onto the literary scene and then essentially disappeared for a while. I think her work is having a bit of a resurgence because she has recently published two novels, and I must say that I have not read either of them yet, although I certainly plan to, um, but I felt like it was really important to go back and to look at this book called Corregidora, which uh, she published in 1975. So as always, um, I like to start with the question of why I think it is important to read this book. Um, you know, again, I think this is a very important voice to be hearing in terms of understanding the experience of being a black woman in the South. So it was written um, in the early 70s, published in 1975, but it was speaking more to the experience of the first half of the 20th century, a, a, a fictional woman who lives in Kentucky, who is a blues singer, who is sort of grappling with her own personal loss and the, the dissolution of her, you know, passionate, impassioned, volatile marriage, and also the legacy of her mother, her grandmother, her great-grandmother, and the enslaver, who in fact uh, was Portuguese and who was the original owner of the first of these women. So the voice is very important to hear, and in fact, it's this unique voice. And that brings me to the second reason why I think you should read it, which is simply that the prose is unbelievable. This is a text that's a little bit challenging to read. It's not super difficult to read, but it is also not just sort of your everyday novel. It is told in some sort of oblique ways that are incredibly impressive and, and ones that really are, are working very hard. They, they, uh, there are a couple of different aspects to the storytelling that we are going to look at. And in every case, when we get around to asking the question we always ask, which is, so what? There's a very robust answer for all of the different choices that Gail Jones is making. And a lot of those choices are a little bit challenging to the reader and they're a little unorthodox, but again, in ways that reap huge benefit when you uh, really take the time to focus on the prose. It's just, it's an incredible, incredible text. So um, it's also just a beautiful reading experience. Everything that we read here at the Fox page has some real literary merit I think some things are sort of a little more heavyweight literary merit than others, and this indeed would be one of those more sort of heavyweight literary merit books. But um, it, it's also just an absolute pleasure to read and really just an absolute delight to dig into. Okay, those of you who love an agenda, first we are going to touch on Gail Jones' biography. I don't want to spend too much time on it. She's had quite a storied life and somewhat of a controversial life, but I don't want to spend too much time on the biography because I think people can get sort of bogged down in that. Uh, after we look at the biography, we're going to dive in. We'll talk about the cover art. We'll talk about the title. Uh, we'll talk about the publication, the circumstances of the publication, the dedication, and then we will dive into the prose itself. We're going to talk quickly about names, and um, the, the structure of the book, we're gonna just sort of look at very briefly, in part because there are these echoes of the very beginning of those very opening pages that are really interesting and well done. We are then going to talk about the narrative stance. We're gonna talk about a certain way in which Gail Jones does this thing where she's sort of melding some of the women in the book together and melding some of the men in the book together in a way that is very purposeful and very telling and one um, that I think you might not uh, fully appreciate unless you've read the book several times and unless you're really willing to really parse what it is she's doing with the prose. We're going to talk about the importance of voice in the novel, uh, then we're going to talk about desire, and then we will close. So 
we'll dive in to just touch quickly on the biography of Gail Jones. So she was born in 1949 in Lexington, Kentucky. Much is made uh, of the fact that she was born in a house that did not have indoor plumbing. And this is the kind of thing that, that um, you know, people really like to focus on that because it seems like this story where she is really overcoming adversity. And in fact, she is. I mean, this is a woman who went on to have a tenured position at the University of Michigan. She got a PhD at Brown. She um, was uh, in close communication with mentors who were very devoted to her, one of whom was Toni Morrison. Uh, and she went to Connecticut College. I mean, this is a woman who really has worked hard in order to hone her craft. But what is not made as much of is the fact that she came from what is essentially a very literary readerly family. So she, um, you know, there were not a lot of creature comforts in her youth, but there was a real emphasis on education and particularly on women in education. I think maybe it's her, her grandmother maybe was a playwright. Again, I don't want to spend too much time on the biography, but she comes from a, a line of women writers that I think are very important to focus on because, well, for many reasons, but one of them being that there is a real matrilineal strain in this book that is, um, it's very important. And, and you can see a little bit of that in her own biography. Uh, so the story in terms of her sort of um, uh, the publication of her work at Brown, she was working with a mentor who gave her work to Toni Morrison. And apparently, you know, legend has it that this kind of box of manuscripts arrived at uh, Toni Morrison's house. And I imagine if you're Toni Morrison, you probably got quite a bit of this, like people saying, oh, my gosh, you have to read so and so. And apparently Toni Morrison did not jump right on it because, in fact, um, you know, probably a busy person, uh, but when she finally did, she was just absolutely floored by the work in the box and particularly by the short novel that was in the box, which was going to become Corregidora. So I would love to read to you briefly the reaction uh, that Toni Morrison had. This was in an article that she wrote about Jones in part uh, in, I believe it was Mademoiselle magazine. So what Morrison said about Gail Jones is the following. This girl had changed the terms, the definitions of the whole enterprise. So deeply impressed was I that I hadn't time to be offended by the fact that she was 24 and had no right to know so much so well. She had written a story that thought the unthinkable, that talked about the female requirement to make generations as an active, even violent, political act. So we have this real endorsement from Toni Morrison, which you know, it, it, much was made of that later. You know, Gail Jones sort of became the writer that Toni Morrison discovered. And um, again, I don't want to make too much of that because, in fact, Gail Jones is a writer who should really stand on her own merits and someone who certainly deserves, you know, accolades from Toni Morrison. And I'm, I'm very happy that Toni Morrison has a platform from which she could uh, introduce the world to Gail Jones. But also, again, this is a writer who um, absolutely deserves all of the attention that she gets. So her life, uh, she, she then went to teach at the University of Michigan. I believe she was the first woman uh, and probably the first black woman to have tenure at Michigan. And there she met a man and fell in love with him. He was someone who was plagued by some mental illnesses. And at one point, uh, he was involved with a controversy where he made threats to a pride parade and um, I think was maybe being sued by the university. All sorts of different things were um, you know, conspiring against him, in part because he was acting in ways that were um, not acceptable. And so the two of them, Jones and this gentleman, went to Europe in order to sort of get away from all of the hubbub that was happening in the U.S. He actually took her name, which is interesting because, of course, in uh, the novel, our protagonist does not, in fact, take her husband's name. So I don't know that they were married, um, but she did, uh, Gail Jones did go to Europe for, for many years with this gentleman and then came back to the United States, I believe, with him. And uh, uh, again, he, he his last name was Jones at that point. And I think they lived kind of a quiet uh, existence. I actually, I'm not sure what has happened with him ultimately. And part of the reason I'm kind of skimming over some of this, and I did not spend a lot of time researching, is that none of this is particularly germane. And I, I resist the idea that these kind of sensational backstory things uh, need to really be you know brought out into the light when what is most important is looking at the pros and really reveling in its beauty and the importance of its message. 
So she just recently, in 2021 and 2022, she wrote respectively Palmares and The Bird Catcher. Again, I have not read those, but I'm really interested in, in doing so. Um, largely because... Corregidora is such an amazing novel. Okay, so um, that actually brings us to the title. I am someone um, who speaks Spanish, and so it's a little tricky for me, having never heard anyone pronounce this book, um, the title of this book, it's a little hard for me to know what you would say. Maybe Corregidora? Corregidora? It is the last name of someone who is Portuguese. It's also the last name of, of the, the enslaver who enslaved um, the, the forebears, the, the, um, the grandmother uh, and the mother of Ursa, who is our protagonist. But so um, it is a last name, which means people in the United States were saying it quite a bit. I don't know exactly how it would be pronounced. I think I might just go ahead and say Corregidora because otherwise, like Corregidora, just, it just sounds too weird to me. Corregidora? Corregidora? I don't know. I'm going to just muddle through. Maybe I'll just say this text or Gail Jones's work. Um, I probably should have listened to an audio version to see because I would hope that somebody explained to uh, some whoever reads this book on Audible um, or, you know, on any of our audio platforms. Uh, I hope that somebody explained from, you know, from Gail Jones' uh, team explained exactly how we are meant to pronounce this last name, but I do not know how. So that, again, is a good segue into the title. Um, do I love the title? Mm, no, I don't really love the title. And I'm also not super wild about the cover art. It's fine. Um, I, I don't. It's not a palette that I love. I like this pink together with the blue down here. And I like the fact that this pink is sort of smearing upward. But I'm just not really sure what to make of the rest of it. Um, you know, we have these kind of markings. We have these bright colors. It just, it just, uh, it just left me kind of wondering. And actually like a little dissatisfied because it's not, again, it's not a palette that I'm, I'm really that wild about. I do like the fact that Gail Jones's name is so kind of uh, up front, but I also, um, I find the title a bit tricky. For me, it's, it's a little bit difficult to pronounce. It's a little bit difficult to remember. And uh, it is the sort of title where so much of the, um, the emphasis is being placed here on the last name of the enslaver that, that I'm like, oh, why are we sort of putting him up at the fore? Like, why, why is that the title of the work? It's, um, I mean, I think there's a, some nuance there, which is very important. So we find out in this book that Ursa, who is our main character, Ursa Corregidora, wow, that is just going to sound weird. Her name is Ursa Corregidora. Um, she, it's, it's this incredible imperative that she has been charged with on the part of her matrilineal um, heritage, on the part of her grandmother and uh, her mother. It, it, it's very important to all of them that she continue making generations. And there, at one point, um, th there's some sort of allusion to the fact that that could be sort of um, like enslavement thinking, meaning that, that these women are continuing to produce, uh, you know, essentially what are, um, you know, property of this enslaver. But in fact, um, you know, it, slavery ends very clearly at, before her mother, before Ursa's mother is born. And importantly, what happens then is the enslavers burn all of the papers. So th they're trying to make it look as if, you know, the slavery never uh, occurred. So part of this idea of continuing generations, it, when you when you look at the whole context, is this idea of Ursa as being able to produce subsequent generations who would be free, presumably, they are no longer enslaved. Also, it is very important that this story, which is being passed down in this kind of oral tradition, it's very important that that story and that voice be carried forward, be carried you know, into the future. So there is a sense um, in carrying on generations and in producing generations, there's this idea of, of uh, continuing the voice and continuing the story and the verbal legacy. Part of this is so that no one forgets the terrible violence uh, that, that these women were subject to, but also part of it is, you know, a testament of their courage and of their strength to sort of survive this man, that their, their um, you know, their legacy and their continuing generations are, uh, you know, evidence of their survival. So um, it, I think you can look at it as their last name as much as it is uh, the last name of the enslaver. But it is, for me, it's a title that's a little tricky, partially because it's difficult to pronounce. Um, and, and we're going to dive into the meaning of it. Actually, 
Let's do that right now. So what's interesting to me, so it is a word that is a Spanish word. You know, if you look at Spain and Portugal, there was some of the same kind of language uh, borrowing happening because this was all happening on the Iberian Peninsula where you have both Spain and Portugal. So he is a Portuguese person who comes over to the United States and, um, you know, begins growing. I believe it is tobacco, at least, maybe sugar. I know he has sugar cane, but also I think tobacco. So um, his life last name is Corregidora. What's interesting to me is that Corregidora with the A at the end, for all of those of you who speak Romance languages, know that that is a feminine word. So it's interesting to me that the Corregidora is a, it's a it's a woman it basically denotes a woman and in this case the Corregidor would be like like the mayor or like the 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 like envoy of like the um the royal like the, it would be the authority figure but in this case it's like the wife of the mayor or like the wife of the ambassador or the wife of the governor so it's interesting to me and i think there's a subtle kind of emasculation on the part of um on the part of gail jones in in giving this man a um a last name that is in effect a uh a, a feminine name a fem it, it denotes in fact a woman and of course we do have descriptions of this enslaver but we have much clearer uh, descriptions of all of these women who are all known as Corregidora. So in some ways, it's a title that, that doesn't, I don't find it super effective, but I think it's very interesting when you kind of tease apart uh, what it means. It also is really interesting to me that in addition to the legacy of enslavement, we also have the legacy of colonialism. So this is obviously, you know, when you have like the royal kind of Spanish and Portuguese uh, last names and people in the quote unquote new world, uh, you know, whether that be South America or North America or Central America, you have this real legacy of colonialism that, that in this case is going hand in hand with the legacy of the enslavement that was going on. I'm also interested in the fact that corregidor, like corre or correr is to run in Spanish. So it's kind of like the person who is running things, but there's also this, this kind of overtone of like the runner, like the person who is running, corregidora, like a, like a runner. So you have this idea too, not only of people escaping en enslavement and you have several stories of, of people running away from the plantation, but you also have this idea of, of these generations as as running ahead into time, um, this idea of these women running toward freedom. So it, in some ways, again, it's a really interesting title. Um, it's just not one that like really resonated with me. So. It was published in 1975, and when it was published, uh, Gail Jones was only 25 years old, and it was a huge success and um, was really acknowledged as this very, very important piece of, uh, of all American literature and certainly of the experience of a Black woman who is writing. She dedicates it to her family, to her parents, which I really love. Um, again, it sort of reinforces this idea of, of the family as being um, literary, also this idea of generations, also this idea of giving voice to family histories. It's it's really, it's actually a very plain dedication, but one I like very much. Okay, now we are going uh, to go ahead and dive in to the text. Here we are on page one, part one. I like these big, bold numbers that they have um, at the top of each section. I believe they're five sections, um, but I really enjoy the fact that they are um, separated with these really bold sections. Okay, and uh, here we are on the first page. It was 1947 when Mutt and I was married. I was singing in Happy's Cafe around on Delaware Street. He didn't like for me to sing after we were married because he said that's why he married me, so he could support me. I said I didn't just sing to be supported. I said I sang because it was something I had to do, but he never would understand that. So this is such a powerful opening. We have what here is a first person narrator. So we have Ursa. We don't know her name yet, but we have this idea of her using her own voice. You know, she is speaking with her own voice in the first person. I did this. I was married. Um, so it, it's it's we talk a lot about voice in the Fox page because it's really important, especially when we are hearing a voice of someone who is not just like your average I mean, average, whatever that means. But like, we're not talking about that kind of anonymous, like 
old school, cisgender, um, you know, male, white narrator. We are in fact talking about a voice that is very different here. And it's a voice that we really need to hear. It's important too that, that there's not an omniscient narrator here who's saying Ursa did this and Ursa did that and Mutt and Ursa did this and Tadpole and Ursa did that. We have Ursa herself telling the story. So first person narratives can be a little tricky because it can feel somewhat limited, but Gail Jones is so good that she's able to also sort of, um, she kind of flows into what feels a bit like a third person narrator in ways that are so, just so well done and also really indicative of um, the importance of having the first person of having Ursa be able to tell us her own story, but also um, the importance of being able to broaden the story a bit. Okay. Um, also, it's very important here that we have, you know, she, she's starting out with this idea of a marriage. So she's starting out with the year 1947. Time is very important. And time in the novel is often melded together. And when it is, that is often because we are meant to think about how far we have come or not come in these generations of women. So, um, you know, there are a few times when Ursa is remembering very clearly sitting on her great grandmother, I mean, sitting on her grandmother's lap and having her tell the story and, and you know, impart this really imperative, this really important concept that she needs to continue their generations. And so we have this idea of the melding of the generations and the melding of time. So she's marking very clearly that it is 1947. We jump ahead later and she marks that year very carefully too. I believe it's 1969, I'm not really sure. Um, not off the top of my head at least, we will get there. Um, but we have this important point in 1947. Um, and this notion of beginning with marriage is important because this is, this is a relationship that is very important to Ursa. It's a complicated, impassioned relationship, but it is one um, th th that really, um, you know, it's filled with a lot of desire on the part of Ursa for Mutt, who is not always good for her. One of the ways in which he is not good for her is the way that he is essentially trying to kind of silence her. So the very first introduction, we find out that they are married and we find out that what that means is Mutt essentially doesn't want her working anymore. So it's a very important opening because we're beginning with the union. You know, we're not starting with a fight, we're starting with their marriage. Um, so there is kind of a positive overtone, but it very quickly slides into this notion of him trying to control her, which is obviously not great. Okay, um, I want to look at a time when um, this is essentially we have kind of a reprisal of, um, of this beginning. So if we look on page 158 and 160, I said I sang because it was something I had to do, but he never would understand that. We were married in December 1947, and it was in April 1948 that Mutt came to Happy's drunk and said if I didn't get off the stage, he was going to take me off. So things are escalating pretty quickly. I also really like the pacing here. I mean, she's just kind of squashing the whole first months of their marriage, their entire marriage, in fact, because they're about to get divorced, which happens on like page four. That's not a spoiler. Um, but but she's kind of squashing the, all, the whole of their marriage into this issue of her voice and how he is threatened by it and really wants to sort of have control over her, um, even though this is something that she really feels the need to do. Uh, and then um, we find out, in fact, that he is going to essentially take her off the stage, at least for some amount of time. So then um, at the end of the evening, uh, when he has come to the happiest place drunk, she says... I didn't see him at first because he was hiding back in the shadows behind the door. I didn't see him till he grabbed me around my waist and I was struggling to get loose. I don't like those men's messing with you, he said. Don't nobody mess with me. Mess with the eyes. That was when I fell. So we have this notion here of her falling. That's all we know in the beginning. And then right after that, there's this real collapsing of time and we have the doctors in the hospital said my womb would have to come out. Mutt and I didn't stay together after that. 
This is astonishing. So in this very first page, we have the entire marriage of Mutt and Ursa. We have the, the idea of him wanting to control her voice. We have the idea of her falling, quote unquote falling. And then we have this idea of her womb having to be uh, removed. So um, we find out very quickly after that, um, when that happens for her, she because she is essentially robbed of the idea or the capacity to uh, be able to create generations for these women in her in her life, um, it, it's a huge uh, blow to her. She essentially feels, you know, like she has been robbed of most of her purpose and they don't stay together. In fact, they get divorced. So, but we find out on page 23 what really happened. So there's this very cool kind of meeting out of information that occurs in the novel where, um, you know, this idea of her, you know, she says, that's when I fell. And then on page 23, we have a little more um, information. This is when she's talking to Tadpole, who is someone who has been very nurturing and taking care of her someone in fact who she marries very fairly soon after she has her hysterectomy and what she says to tadpole when he questions whether or not she and mutt are together um what she says what ursa says is from the day he throwed me down those stairs we not together and we not coming back together so you have this idea here again of her voice and she's telling tadpole her her sort of new uh caregiver and her new sort of love mm, he loves her she never answers back. It's so sad. He says, I love you. And we don't, we, she, she does not respond in kind, but they do get married. Um, but so we have this idea that, that um, when he is asking about Mutt, she, she is very clear about the fact that they will not be getting together. You do wonder, even at this point on page 23, if she is perhaps uh, protesting a bit much, but it is very important that she is so deeply hurt physically and emotionally by um, what he has taken from her uh, that, that in fact she is determined to not be with him. So we have that is sort of on page 23, we have this expansion of this idea of, you know, then I fell. And then later in the book, we have an even further um, sort of reprise of this scene. So on page 158, that this is, um, they've gone through this long thing where he's calling her a piece of shit. And, and it's very clear, he actually keeps saying, you're my piece of shit, as if, uh, and that it's like whether or not she is some sort of commodity that he can sell, which is obviously extremely loaded because of the uh, terrible enslavement that has happened in their family. Ursa says, when he came to the place the next night, it wasn't to sell his piece of shit. It was to try to take it off the stage. And then when his piece of shit wouldn't get off the stage and Tadpole and some other men put him out, it was to knock that piece of shit down some stairs. So I love this kind of structure in a novel. In the very first page, we have essentially what is this entire story of a marriage that is totally played out in, in this very short span of time. Then 20 pages later, and then 130 pages later, we have um, like a revisiting and, and a deepening of this understanding. What I like about that in particular is that each time you come back to um, the, this altercation between the two of them, when you come back to him, you know, throwing her down the stairs and in fact causing her to lose her uh, uterus at that point she so she was pregnant at that point it was early on um, I'm, I'm fairly certain I mean it's all the, it's an interesting book because it's fairly kaleidoscopic also my memory is terrible and it was all it was way long ago last week that I read this book so um, I might not be remembering an important plot point here but um, I do think that she is she, at one point she asks if it would be a problem if her, she had lost um, if there were something in the uterus when she lost the uterus so there is this idea that potentially she was going to have Mutt's child um, and then was not able to so um, when she loses that capability every time we return to this uh, fight between the two of them resulted in this really difficult moment for her and it essentially changed the course of her life, we have a deeper understanding of it because of what has happened in the subsequent pages. Okay, I want to move on quickly to talk about the names in the book. So Gail Jones is an incredible prose stylist. I mean, there are just some virtuoso passages in here and what she's doing with the names is really phenomenal. So right at the very beginning, we find out um, on the second page here that uh, Ursa's name 
the very first time we we uh, you know hear her name is when Tadpole, who is taking her home from the hospital, he's the one who owns Happy's Place. He protects her. He's taking care of her. He's nurturing her. Um, he calls her UC. UC is short for Ursa Corregidora. But this idea of UC is important because the very first time we see her, we see her as someone who sees. That sounds like a, a tongue twister right there. But when he says, how you feeling, you see, this idea of you see, it, it's as if we are meant to see her as a seer. So she is really someone who sees things. She can see the truth, you see. Um, but also, Ursa is very important. Ursa is like Ursa Major, Ursa Minor. That is the bear. Um, the constellation is the bear. And in Latin, it is the bear. So we have this idea of her as being this kind of very forceful creature, like this very kind of, um, uh, like a very, um, you know, uh, uh, strong and powerful and and very sort of domineering animal you know really big and and um y you know powerful and, and and very sort of predatory in some ways not like a panther or something but like there there is a sense of like you really got to watch out there's also the concept of a mama bear like you know there, there's a whole kind of cliche about mama bears and how um how protective they are of their young so there is some irony there because in fact she is like a you know a bear she is like a mama bear type but she does not in fact have any young um there's also the idea that Ur, as like a, a stem, you know, as like a base for her name, the Ur something is like the very, very original something, like the very, um, the very first of something. So um, in this case, we have Ur. Um, she's not, in fact, the first person of her of her line of women, and she's coming, you know, at the end of this long matriarchal group of women who we hear their voices, we um, see some of what they look like, we hear a lot about their stories, different details, different crises, uh, different pains, pleasures, all of that. We know this group of women, you know, n not super well. They're not like the main characters of this this uh, book, but we know them fairly well. And yet this is Ursa is sort of this, um, you know, she's like on some level, she's meant to be kind of like the original of them. So it's a um, there's kind of a, a shift that's happening there. And I think on some level you can read that as like, Maybe because she is not, in fact, going to have more children. She is. She's the end of the line in some ways. That she is kind of the um, the the most kind of. Uh, the, the one who sort of encapsulates all the rest of them. So I love the idea of her name. And then, of course, this corregidora is like the mayor's wife or like the, the, the governor's wife. So there's this sense of her as as like it's a very powerful, powerful name. Then, of course, we have Mutt. And this was another one of those cases where Gail Jones very skillfully was meeting out this information. So we hear that his name is Mutt. And um, right at the very beginning, he's the first name that we hear. And of course, the idea of a Mutt is someone who is like a mix of a whole bunch of different things. So, um, you know, different breeds of, of dog, essentially. He's also a dog, which is important because he acts like kind of a dog. I mean, in the sense of like, you know, a man is a dog, like, a, like not a good dude. Um, Aunt, like a dirty old dog, that kind of thing. Um, but you also, one point much later in the novel, Tadpole is talking, actually, it might be Urban. So there's another Ur person, Urban being a man who she also meets later, much later in her life, Ursa does. Um, one, of, one of the two of them, I can't remember which, says to her um, in reference to her father. So Ursa's father is, um, I believe, French origin and um, or he went to France after he had his daughter. But he um, the, the the person was saying that she is not, in fact, Corregidora's daughter, that he you know, she has this other father. But of course, through her, her through this maternal line, she has a lot of this Portuguese person. So she's partly Portuguese and she's partly uh, African and African-American. And then she's also partly um, whatever her father's, uh, you know, ethnicity is. So that person, I believe, it's tadpole says that she also is like a mutt and that she's got sort of everything in her which is really interesting to me because i hope it was tadpole i think it i think it was um because he's sort of he is seeing her he's like equating her with mutt in a way that i like very much because i think on some level um you know you get the idea that Ursa has never uh, not 
loved Mutt. I mean, it's a, it's a problematic love affair, certainly. Um, but, but really, there is a lot of love that she has for him, even if it's conflicted. So this idea of the two of them as being connected by the fact that they are this kind of whole mix of origins is, is really deft and interesting. So Mutt is his first name. We then find out um, that his last name is Thomas. So Thomas can be a, uh, uh, it's slang for penis. It also, in terms of the saint, so you can have doubting Thomas. Uh, Thomas was one of the apostles. He was actually the one that doubted whether or not Jesus had like ascended into heaven. Um, so you have this idea of a doubting Thomas. So if Mutt Thomas, there, it's, he's associated with doubts in some ways, um, which I think is very, uh, it's very apt in some ways because he's sort of doubting her worth at certain points she's doubting his worth there's a lot of doubt associated with him we also learn you know like 20 pages after we learn his last name we learn that his middle name is Fillmore and um, I didn't do any like historical research about Fillmore I just looked at the word itself and this idea of feel more like Fillmore I mean this idea of like feeling like I mean he's definitely someone who is creating a lot of feelings in Ursa and he's also someone who feels things deeply himself so this idea of feel more also the idea of fill more um, like filling you know all of these needs that she has. This is a book that I love because of how it treats female desire. Uh, there's a lot of expression of how Ursa um, and, you know, the other women in the book are really desirous of men. And they are really, um, really sort of have this strong desire to have sexual intercourse with these men. And so there's this idea of being filled by him sexually and otherwise. So I really like this idea of um, Mutt Fillmore Thomas is a, it's a, it's a very sort of, uh, it's a name that tells us a lot. So we have this kind of forceful name um, also for Mutt and certainly for Ursa Corregidora. Then we have Tadpole McCormick. So Tadpole is, you know, one of the first people we are introduced to, and he has actually a lot of airtime toward the beginning. And he is taking care of Ursa when she first comes out of the hospital. And he's doing all of these really sweet things for her. He's cooking for her, although she doesn't really like what he's cooking and she's sort of nauseated, so she's not really eating it. Um, he makes vegetable soup. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's happening in the beginning that's like kind of emasculating, which I hate to be... Uh, you know, prescribing to sort of these like gender norms, but it is very clear that Gail Jones is is associating our um, our tadpole with a lot of sort of maternal and a lot of sort of female jobs. He's emptying the bedpan. He's making her soup that she can only eat the broth of because it's like a vegetable soup. It's not like a hearty beef stew. It's like a vegetable soup and she just drinks the broth. So we have all of these different ways where Tadpole is really trying so hard to take care of her and to meet her needs. And um, you just the whole time you're kind of like, oh gosh, like I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I think he likes her a little more than she likes him. And in fact, there's another character who essentially says as much when, um, when our uh, protagonist Ursa decides she might marry Tadpole. Cat Lawson says, you know, you should think about how you felt about him before this accident. And in fact, she had not loved him before. And again, when he says he loves her, Ursa is not able to answer back in kind. So um, you do have this sense of Tadpole as being this kind of um, emasculated man. And I think that the name is so important in expressing that. So if we have Mutt, who's kind of a dog, you know, and you can associate that with some some power and some, um, you know, some sort of masculine kind of energy and some sort of forcefulness um, and, and some sort of, uh, you know, like, like a grit. A tadpole, on the other hand, you know, it's it's like not even a frog. So if we have this idea of having to kiss a lot of frogs in order to get your prince, he's literally not even a frog. He's like a little tadpole. So he's somebody who's like, like, I mean, almost fetal, which is interesting. That just occurred to me just now, but and not quite. But like you have him as a, as a sort of a like a, um, you know, he's not like the full being. He's not a full expression of the frog. He's just sort of one of the stages. So and then often in the book, they refer to him as Tad which, you know, is sort of like a small amount of something, like just put a tad of that in there, that kind of thing, just like a tiny bit of something, which basically means that the pole has been removed. So this idea of having the pole removed, you know, even if you're not like a huge subscriber to phallic, you know, whatever symbolism, this idea of having the pole taken away is is 
pretty damning in terms of him, um, you know, like essentially being neutered. We also have the idea of the tail of the tadpole as, as disappearing. I think it's like, I don't know if it's reabsorbed or falls off or what, but when it becomes, you know, when the creature becomes the frog, the sort of this long tail is gone. So you do have this sense of tad as being, um, you know, again, emasculated by his name, um, which is so artful on the part of Gail Jones. We also have McCormick as the last name, which is an Irish last name. So Cormick is um, actually a chariot driver. So you have this idea of, um, you know, that that sounds very grand, but this is the son of the chariot driver. So obviously MC in Irish means son of. So here we have the son of the chariot driver. He's not even the chariot driver himself. He's like, you know, he's not like the chauffeur. He's, or I mean, I guess you could think of Helios, who's like the god who would like drive the chariot with the sun, you know, across the sky. But I'm not really sure that's what we're supposed to be uh, digging into here. So we have, he is the son of someone. It's also an Irish name. And so ethnically, when you think of Irish, uh, you know, people in Ireland in general, the people who are there are white people. So you have this idea of him as having the last name of someone who is sort of, you know, very ethnically white, very ethnically Irish in this way um, that, that I think is also stealing something from, you know, his, his the, the blackness of him, which is important to Ursa. So you have this idea of him being emasculated in several different ways, which I just think is so skillful. We have Kat Lawson, who is so important because she um, really is speaking some truth and she is someone who uh, has desire for other women. She is a woman who desires Ursa her desire is rebuffed, um, but you have the sense of her as being someone who's powerful-ish and very sensual, um, and, and you associate that, her real name is Catherine, but you associate that with the feline, this idea of cat. And interestingly, she's very closely associated uh, with a young girl named Jeff, or Jeffy, which is interesting because young Jeffy um, is also, in fact, um, someone who is homosexual, is attracted to women. She comes on to Ursa one night, and Ursa is totally off-put by this. But it's interesting to me that Gail uh, Jones has given um, Jeffy essentially a male name. So you have this idea of, of um, sexuality and of names as being very important in terms of indicating, um, you know, sexual potency. So I also really like the idea that if Ursa is, you know, we associated a bit with the constellations and with nature and with the idea of something very, very powerful with this bear, I also like the idea that Gail, so Gail, Gail Jones, our author here, a Gail can also be a force of nature in terms of like, you know, high winds and gale force winds and whatnot. So I like that idea of, of Ursa as having, you know, just a little tiny uh, similarity with Gale, who is in fact our author. Okay, so I want to move on um, and talk a bit about the narrative stance. So we already discussed the importance of the first person. So I want to jump down and talk a little bit about uh, the idea of the, the ways in which Gale very, Gale, in which Jones very deftly moves into the third person. So we're going to look on page eight. So when, uh, oftentimes, when the first person is changing into the third person, it's it's um, still we're still kind of close to the thir first person with Ursa because she's often listening to the voices of her forebears, of her maternal forebears. It's it's very generous of Gail Jones to have typeset those in italics. So when we are moving more toward the voices either of a dream or the voices of a memory when she is remembering her mother or um, remembering something that happened with Mutt or she's recalling a dream about one of her grandmothers uh, or great grandmothers, you, you have this sense, all of that is in italics. So there is this nice sense of Roman face type for everything that's happening, like tr like really happening. And then we have um, this shift to italics when we are uh, sort of sliding into the third person. So she says, I'm recording this in New York and it suddenly just got so dark. So I had to um, rearrange my lighting a little bit here uh, so that I can actually see what it is I'm reading. Uh, so here on page eight, a Portuguese seaman turned plantation owner. He took her out of the field when she was still a child and put her to work in his whorehouse while she was still a child. She was to go out or he would bring the men to her and the money they gave her she was to turn over to him. There were other women he used like this. She was the pretty little one with the almond eyes and the coffee bean skin, his favorite. 
a good little piece, my best, Dorita, little gold piece. So, I mean, this is pretty awful. We have, again, this is Corregidora. This is the Portuguese man who is the enslaver, who is also, um, you know, using these women as uh, sex workers. So um, it's getting pretty insidious the very first time we are hearing about him and about the legacy uh, with these women. But we have this sense um, of, of the voices. So here we have this definite shift toward the third person a Portuguese seaman turned plantation owner, he took her out of the field. So we do have this shift away from the first person, away from I married mutt, blah, 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 to the third person, which is so deft and it's so well done. Um, eventually, you know, we, we will shift back, even within the italic se section, we will shift back toward the first person, but it is so deft and it's such a beautiful way of allowing the reader to hear all of these different voices and to really um, begin to sort of hear uh, what, what has happened to these women, this kind of harrowing experience that the women in the family uh, have, have had. Okay, so, and I want to talk a little bit about the idea of this conflation. So in when we have these sections where we are talking about the grandmother or the great grandmother and uh, or the mother or Ursa, there is this kind of melding together of the women. And again, on some level, this is very important because they have, um, I mean, for several different reasons. One of them is that we are meant to believe and we're meant to reflect, I think, on the fact that these women have experienced this one, you know, huge tragedy together, which is the fact that they have been enslaved and, and the fact that many of them were used as sex workers against their will. So you have this idea of, of this sort of common tragedy, this common, um, you know, crime that was committed against them. So you have, in that sense, they are similar in that they're telling a story that is, is sort of universal, at least to their family, to the three of those women. Happily, Ursa um, was not fathered by this man who in fact fathered both Ursa's grandmother and Ursa's mother. Uh, but in fact, um, you know, she had her own father and there was sort of a moving away and she was born after slavery was over. So you have this idea of things changing, but these women are sort of melded together in a way that I think is is truly, it's, it's just really very well done. So page 72, we're gonna take a look at this melding of these women. So this is Ursa's grandma, Wow. See, I'm confusing it because there is this kind of melding together of the women. So this is actually Ursa's grandmother talking about her experience, um, you know, at the end of slavery. So she, when she, in this passage, you'll hear that there's lots of confusion, essentially, between who she is talking about when she's referring to mama. And again, the importance of that is because in some ways they are all the mother of Ursa. You know, in some ways they all have contributed um, in their own way to her genetic being, also to her survival, and also to her legacy, this idea of, of who she is and what she has come from and sort of what imperatives she has as someone who is leading a life with purpose. So it's so interesting to me because you'll, you'll hear how kind of confusing it gets, but again, that's very purposeful. He wanted to keep me the bastard, but it's hard to always remember what you were feeling when you ain't feeling it exactly that way no more. But when she came back for me, I was so happy. I didn't know what to do and was glad to get away from there. But by then I was big with your mama. Nah, she was born down in Louisiana. Then we came up here, you know, to get better work. And mama was working for some Irish peoples and I was staying home taking care of your mama. And then a little later on, Mama would stay at home and I was out working. So here's, so in this case, um, here on the bottom of 75, Ursa is talking about her own father. Mama never would talk about him. She said he had gypsy in him, most of which I know my grandmama told me and told me not to tell my mama she told me. Mama never would have told me anything. You mixed up every which way, ain't you? What do you mean? You seem like you got a little bit of everything in you, he said. So one of the best things that I learned in graduate school is this idea that when you are having a sense of like, wait, who are we talking about? Like mama, like who, whose mother and wh you know, who is it, the voice that is speaking and which mother are they referring to? When you have that kind of confusion, and it's not just because you're like nodding off at the end of the day while you're reading in bed, um, you know, if you're relatively focused and you still are confused, I think it's important to step back and ask yourself, 
maybe the author means you to be. And in this case, there absolutely is this purposeful kind of conflation of these women. The example I always give, and I think it's a, it's a very good one, is the idea of 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. In that case, you know, everyone is like Jose Arcadio or Juan Aurelio or, um, you know, Juan Buendia. So they, they all come from these different generations and yet they have all these same names because essentially they're all experiencing the same thing and history is essentially repeating itself, you know, kind of generation after generation, very much like we have here. So it's interesting to me and it makes a huge amount of sense that the women are all kind of conflated in this because they are this one matrilineal line. It's also, I'm just noticing now too, that um, she's pretty separate from other women in the book. She has a very close relationship with Kat Lawson and you know, there's quite a bit that happens with Jeffy, but, but there's this sense of her as really um, being in a world of men when she has come from this world of women, which is really important. Okay, but what's interesting to me too is that we have this conflation of, of, of the maternal line, which again makes a lot of sense to me, but we also have this conflation of men in the book. So um, also on page eight, kind of back to the beginning here, this is when Tadpole uh, is, it's, he's just sort of getting to know her better. He has brought her up into the rooms. She was living with Mutt in the Drake Hotel Drake, of course, being a male duck. So there's a lot, um, and Drake sounding like rake, you know, like he is a cad or a rake, um, a ladies man kind of a thing. So we have very important names here, but Tadpole has taken her from their room in the Drake hotel, hotel after the hospital and he is keeping um, care of her up in the rooms above Happy's place. So they're talking about these generations so right, right from the start, actually, Ursa is really, um, really laying out her story for Tadpole and, you know, then, of course, also for the reader. So she says, Tadpole's talking about people who keep certain things inside. And Ursa says, well, some things can't be kept in. What I didn't tell you is old man Corregidora fathered my grandmama and my mama, too. Taddy frowned but said nothing. What my mama always told me is, Ursa, you got to make generations something I've always grown up with. Tad said nothing. Then he said, I guess you hate him then, don't you? I don't even know the bastard. He frowned and I knew he hadn't meant the old man, but I went on as if he had. So this is so interesting to me because right at the beginning of the novel, Tad, I mean, she even calls him Taddy, which is like even like a diminutive of the diminutive. Um, again, pretty, pretty emasculating, pretty neutering for poor Tadpole who's just trying to help her out. Um, when Tadpole says, I guess you hate him then, and she says, I don't even know the bastard, she's talking about this, this you know, grandfather of hers, or great grandfather and grandfather of hers, this enslaver. Um, and in fact, he is talking about Mutt. So you have this kind of, uh, they're crossing over each other, but essentially Mutt is being conflated with Corregidora because she, T Tad is thinking he's one thing and she's thinking he's referring to another. So you have them both melded together. So this idea of these men, um, you know, who have the potential to be the father of these generations they are meant to build. Um, and and actually in the case of, of Mutt, in order to stop these generations from succeeding. So you have this idea of, of, uh, of these men as being sort of together, this enslaver together with Mutt, for whom actually Orsa has a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of love and a lot of desire. But it's really interesting to me that we have not only the conflation of the women, but also this interesting conflation of the men uh, in at least some of the men and in some slight ways throughout the novel. I want to touch just briefly on this idea of voice in kind of a, a broader sense. So we've, we've already spoken about the importance of this being a first person narration and the idea of Ursa as really being able to tell her own story in literally her own words. Then of course you have um, in these sort of dreamy sections or these memory sections that are in italics, you have the voices of her mother and her grandmother and even her great grandmother sometimes. And also we hear a lot of her voice. There is dialogue throughout this book that is so good. We just touched on that example where Ursa is very forceful in her dialogue and is saying things that are very, um, you know, sort of bold and she is speaking the truth and she is revealing a huge amount about herself. And what's so cool in some ways is when she's having conversations, whether it's with Kat 
or her mother or the guy Urban who he meets she meets later or um, yeah, or Tadpole we're seeing her really reveal herself and we are actually hearing the words that she's speaking so we're hearing her choose those words and because we have this dialogue where she is directly quoted we are hearing the words as if she were speaking orally to us which is so cool there's also this very cool thing in the very beginning of the book when she's in the hospital, um, she's cursing like crazy. She's using all of these, um, you know, all of these words. And she says later, we don't hear her cursing, um, but it's reported to her by Tadpole. And apparently she thinks that everyone in the hospital is mutt. And so she's really cursing at all of these people. She does not remember this, but there's this idea of her as using words as like this forceful, um, you know, means to sort of punish people and to get some sort of vengeance. And interestingly, her grandmother and her mother, more so her grandmother than her mother, her mother's a bit quieter and a bit more sort of stoic about things, but certainly her grandmother uses all sorts of profanity there's a lot of f words there's a lot of a lot of everything in there um you have this real sense of of both of all of these women as using particularly the grandmother and ursa as using language and you know sort of quote unquote bad language in these ways that are very forceful and i think you can read um you know this idea of when ursa is in the hospital and she is essentially losing her ability to produce generations and to fulfill this desire of her own um you have this sense of her as using language in this very cathartic way to really sort of, um, you know, begin to work on the anger that she has toward, uh, toward Mutt. We have some very specific, um, you know, times too where words and the importance of words are, uh, are, is really underscored very artfully by Gail Jones. So she's, she's describing, um, this is again one of those italicized sections, and Ursa is describing her grandmother. Her hands had lines all over them. It was as if the words were helping her, as if the words repeated again and again would be a substitute for memory, were somehow more than the memory, as if it were only the words that kept her anger. So you have this idea of the words, again, it literally says, as if it were only the words that kept her anger. So this idea of words and of the grandmother's words as being so powerful and being these real vehicles for anger and the expression of anger um, and the fact that these words are passed through and then the fact that the words are actually making their way onto the page and being read widely is really, really powerful. If we look at page 11, um, so at one point, Ursa, when she is a young child, um, she questions her grandmother whether or not something is true. Um, this idea that the, that Corregidora had been um, having sex both with um, her grandmother and her uh, mother. Sorry, with her great-grandmother and her grandmother. You telling the truth, great-grand? She slapped me. When I'm telling you something, don't you ever ask if I'm lying, because they didn't want to leave no evidence of what they'd done, so it couldn't be held against them, and I'm leaving evidence, and you got to leave evidence too, and your children got to leave evidence. And when it comes time to hold up the evidence, we got to have evidence to hold up. That's why they burned all the papers, so there couldn't be evidence to hold up against them. I was five years old then. So we have, again, this imperative, this really strong sense that, that someone needs to sort of tell their story. Someone needs to keep these words intact. And it is very much in this oral tradition. And it's really beautiful because the papers were burned and there's no actual evidence um, th that this oral tradition is being preserved here in the pages of this book that Gail Jones is writing. It's just it's a really, really beautiful way to speak to the power of, of words, the power of, of language, and certainly when stories are, are, are sort of unspeakable. I mean, you know, they're really taking these really horrific, very private, um, you know, sort of sequestered and, and kind of shrouded stories and bringing them into the light with words. It's really, it's really beautiful. Um, okay, I want to move on to talk about desire and this idea of, um, of, of sex and of violence as being really um, sort of of a piece. But again, I mentioned this in the very beginning. It was so interesting to, to read uh, this story and to realize how much Ursa's desire, her sexual desire, is, is really a very, strong, um, a very strong urge in her and one that she voices uh, really pretty forcefully. So on pages 60 and 61, we have a conversation between Kat Lawson and and Ursa, where Kat Lawson is essentially um, is talking to Ursa about having been rebuffed, about how Ursa, um, you know, declined Kat Lawson's advances. 
that sounds very shrouded, but essentially Kat Lassen was attracted to Ursa and wanted to be physically involved and in, in very sort of subtle ways. This is not like a, um, you know, there wasn't like a big sex scene or anything, but Ursa is not, um, does not feel the same way about Kat. So Kat says, you don't know what it's like to feel foolish all day in a white woman's kitchen and then to come home and feel foolish in the bed at night with your man. I wouldn't have mind the other so much if I didn't have to feel like a fool in the bed with my man. You don't know what that means, do you? And then um, Ursa, in fact, does have some sense of what it is like to be rejected. And so she says the following. Yes, I know what it feels like. I remembered how his shoulders felt when he was going inside me and I had my hands on his shoulders. But I also remembered that night I was exhausted with wanting and I waited, but he wouldn't turn toward me and I kept waiting and wanting him and I got close to him up against his back, but he still wouldn't turn to me. And then I lay on my back and tried hard to sleep and I finally slept. So again, you have this voicing of this desire. You know, she was the one, a lot of times I think we just think of sex as, you know, this sort of, I mean, this is such an overstatement, but you know, it, the idea of, of woman as being very desirous and a man sort of rebuffing her advances is not something that we read a ton about in, uh, in literature. And so it's really good, I think, to, to have this idea of, of this sexual desire. I mean, part of it you can you know, argue is, is having to do with procreation, but this is you know, after, uh, even after she has had the hysterectomy and cannot have children, there is this desire that lingers. So we look on page 132, this is um there's this really beautiful part in the book where we go back in time to ursa's childhood and she's talking about this friend may alice and may alice is someone who is having sexual experiences when she's relatively young i believe maybe in eighth grade and this is what may alice says once you had it in you it seems like you have to keep having it in you i heard mama talking about this woman that didn't have it done to her and went crazy. You gotta have it in you or you go crazy. Importantly, that storyline doesn't end particularly well because May Alice in fact gets pregnant, as you might imagine that she would, and um, you know, it is not, does not stay with the husband and it ends in, in sort of this disaster. So you have this kind of counterpoint with this idea of having generations and of procreating, but it is really interesting because May Alice talks about sexual intercourse. You know, there's never anything really about the, the you know, the man, the young man that she's with it's really all about her own experience and essentially how much she really enjoys you know the physical act of it on page 149 um this is when ursa is talking about mutt um the, from from before the accident during their brief marriage whenever he wanted it and i didn't he'd take me because he knew that i wouldn't say no or even if i had sometimes i wonder about whether or not he would have taken me anyway but those times that I wanted it and he sensed that I wanted it, that's when he would turn away from me. So again, I mean, this is still, you know, this is things are not going well and Mutt is still rebuffing her in this sense, but this idea of her expressing her desire and how it is, um, you know, not, it's unrequited essentially does speak to this desire that, that she has. So um, there's also though a, a real connection between violence and, uh, you know, sexual desire in this book. So at one point there there is a, a, a time when um, Mutt is, when Mutt is talking to Ursa about the fact that maybe those women, maybe what nobody wants to talk about is the fact that those women actually did have love for this enslaver, which is a question that is kind of, it kind of lingers in the book. And it, it's it's one that's very difficult and it doesn't really have an answer. Um, but but there is this sense of, of um, the complexity of the relationships that these women uh, had with this person who eventually, you know, is the father of, of their children. Any of them, even them he had out in the fields, if he wanted them, he just shipped their own husbands out of bed and get in there with them. But didn't nothing happen like what happened over on the other plantation? Because I guess that other plantation served as a warning. Because they might want your pussy. But if you do anything to get back at them, it'll be your life they be wanting. And then they make even that some kind of a sex show. All of them beatings and killings wasn't nothing but sex circuses and all them white peoples, men, women, children, crowding around to see.
So you have this idea of this terrible, terrible legacy of sexual violence during the times of enslavement. But even, you know, when we think about like the, the, the most sort of the touch point scene of this book, which is where Mutt cannot, you know, sort of control her and get her off the stage and into, you know, his own private, you know, realm by himself where he can control her. Um, you know, we have this violence that that is uh, that that really is the impetus for the story. And um, when he is, in fact, pushing her down the stairs. So you have this sense of, um, of, of violence continuing. It's a little attenuated, but you do have this sense of, of, of desire as being something that is very complex um, and, and very rich and a real driving force for both men, men and women in uh, throughout the novel. OK. So the close of the novel um, is a good sort of continuation of this idea of desire and of violence and of pain and sort of the complications. And it's not, you know, it's not like a bright ending to this book, but it's such an interesting sort of distillation of a lot of what we have talked about. So here we have this kind of melding, this conflation of, of these different people who we've seen. This is at the very end of the book when Mutt and Ursa are together and are sort of reuniting sexually. Um, and, and we really, you know, the book ends on this very uh, sort of intense sexual moment. So I'm going to essentially read this this last page and, and just sort of let you take in this beautiful prose to together um, with the way that this ending passage is really sort of winding together a lot of the strands that we've spoken about today. Oh, and in the very beginning, she's making a reference throughout the book. She's been trying to think of um, there was something that her great grandmother did to Corregidora, the, the slave owner, that made him send her away. So there was some kind of a mystery involved here of like the power that the great grandmother had um, that was enough power to be sent away from uh, his plantation. It had to be sexual, I was thinking. It had to be something sexual that Great Graham did to Corregidora. I knew it had to be sexual. What is it a woman can do to a man that makes him hate her so bad he want to kill her one minute and keep thinking about her and can't get her out of his mind the next? In a split second, I knew what it was. In a split second of hate and love, I knew what it was. And I think he might have known too. He there is referring uh, to, to uh, Mutt. A moment of pleasure and excruciating pain at the same time. A moment of broken skin but not sexlessness. A moment just before sexlessness. A moment that stops just before sexlessness. A moment that stops before it breaks the skin. I could kill you. This is what she is saying to Mutt. I held his ankles, so she is on her knees in front of him. So this is, again, this, I mean, not only is this a sexual moment, but this is, in fact, an act of fellatio. So she's thinking about this while she is fellating him. I held his ankles. It was like I didn't know how much was me and Mutt and how much was Great Graham and Corregidora. Like Mama, when she started talking to Great Graham, but was what Corregidora had done to her, to them, any worse than what Mutt had done to me, than what we had done to each other? than what mama had done to daddy or what he had done to her in return, making her walk down the street looking like a whore, I could kill you. He came and I swallowed. He leaned back, pulling me up by the shoulders. I don't want a kind of woman that hurt you, he said. Then you don't want me. I don't want a kind of woman that hurts you. Then you don't want me. I don't want a kind of woman that hurts you. Then you don't want me. He shook me till I fell against him crying. I don't want a kind of man that'll hurt me either, I said. He held me tight. It's a very difficult scene to end on on some level, but there is a certain amount of hope. I mean, both of them are admitting the fact that, that they have caused each other a lot of pain, and yet we, we see them at the end, you know, really coming together, um, you know, in, in this embrace and with this very cathartic sort of experience that they have had. It's such an interesting uh, meditation, though, on this legacy, on this idea of, um, you know, all of these different generations moving toward Ursa and, and this violence and this sexual desire um, that is that is this very complex and, and very difficult thing uh, to handle. And yet um, one that's really uh, very forceful and, and, and um, very potent and, and really very complicated and very complex uh, and difficult uh, sort of thing that is bringing the men and women together in this way.
So in many ways, the end of the book is it's a very difficult uh, way to finish the text. And in some ways, it is a very difficult book to read because there is a lot of pain and there is a lot of complexity in the pages. But I hope that you have um, really gotten something today out of uh, this deep dive into prose that is so well done and is so beautiful and is really important in terms of giving us a story and giving us a voice uh, that is unusual and that is really speaking to the complexity of what it is to be a woman and what it is to be someone who is black in the South and someone who is uh, you know, dealing with the legacy of uh, enslavement and of colonialism and of being a woman. So I, I, I hope it's been a, a fruitful and uh, an interesting deep dive today. And I hope that you take the time uh, to reread Gail Jones because her writing is so incredible and definitely, definitely deserves not just a deep dive, uh, but in fact, a return to it. And once I read those two more recent novels, uh, I will get back to you. So happy reading. <laughs>